Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your glorious love. We don't even understand it. Very difficult for us here on this sinful earth, this selfish place, this uh, place of crime and death and suffering, for us to even imagine what heaven is like, what living in your presence is like. We ask that you will open today our minds and hearts that we may understand you and that our hope will turn into trust and belief as we accept the promises of Scripture. Thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayer because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I chose 1 Corinthians 13 today because there are some superlatives there in that passage which I want to just grind into your head. And by the way, it was Paul who wrote this letter to the Corinthians. But somehow I, I think always that Paul must have been lifted very close to heaven when he wrote these words. It starts out with the first verse, and it almost takes you by surprise because Paul is comparing all these fruit of the Spirit as he writes this. And he wants to tell us what is the best thing that God gave to us. He wants to tell us not only that, he wants to tell us the principle that guides all of heaven. It is always love. New, or the King James uses the word charity, but translated in the New English versions, you know that that word is translated into love. So when you think about the great controversy, you think about Satan confronting and challenging God, you realize that God is never going to, to just take Satan, crush him in his hands, and throw him on the earth and say, I'm stepping on you now, I'm going to bury you because you are garbage, and turn him over, and that's it. Because everybody looks at God in the heavenly universe, and they know that he has always been loved. He has always been loved. And so here you have this rebellion, which God cannot settle with power. He will not settle it by wiping Satan out, but he will settle the problem with love. You know what the problem is with our country today? They think in Washington, when somebody bombs our building, that all we've got to do is go and bomb them in return. Does it work? Nope. I went to Pakistan in 2012. I spent a year there. When I would go across the street from the, from the Union office, there was, it's on a main road, the main road from the south of Pakistan to the north. There are little restaurants, just simple places. You pay, what was it, maybe, maybe 25 cents for a meal. Laboring people are sitting there. There's a little television in the corner. You know what the television plays all the time? Drone strikes. You see the drone coming in. You see the house over here. You watch. There's a puff of smoke from that drone. and It goes into the house and it blows up. And they will tell us later that there were two people, two terrorists who were killed. And there were ten that were collateral damage. And what do you think happens in the hearts of the Pakistanis who know that this has just happened in the neighboring province? Just imagine you were living in Texas, or you were living in Arizona, and Mexico was settling scores with people here in the United States, and so they would send drones from Mexico, and they'd blow up two criminals, and there'd be ten innocent people that were killed at the same time. Force versus force only makes a bigger problem. Isn't that right? Even in our sinful 
state. By the way, there are people in, in authority. There are pilots who are sitting at computers pressing the button who also do not agree that force will settle a problem. Imagine the consciences of people as they're watching on live TV and they watch a child run out from the, from the house or a woman step out just before the drone strikes there. I would sit and eat my food and in the corner this was going and I'm a white man <laughs> dressed in western clothes in the middle of these folks. If they ever asked me where I was from, I would never say I'm from the United States. I'd say I'm from Fresno. I didn't lie, did I? <laughs> but nobody knew where Fresno was. Jesus could not use that. And so, when we read the scripture, I want you to understand, I'm talking not now about just his relationship with us, the principle. It's like gravity. You jump up in the air, where do you come down? <laughs> You're going to come back on the ground. If you would go toward God, it would be only stronger love. Because love is the foundation. It's like oxygen. You can't live on this world without oxygen. The other day, my granddaughter learned that uh, there's no water up in space. Well, where do they get their water? How do they drink? Well, they get it from the breath that they breathe, and there's an atmosphere in that spacecraft. What else? Well, they take all the water from the pee, and they take all the water from the waste and so forth, and they recycle this through a machine. I actually thought about this when the drought was on. I thought, you know, you have a limited amount, you have a limited amount of water, but there's a tank under the house where you put the sewage, and maybe we could take the water back out and flush it again. Oxygen, we can't live without it. Love, we can't live without it. God can't live without that. God's character, God's being is always love. The three, four hours that Jesus spent on the cross outside Jerusalem, when he was in darkness and he could not see his Father, he could not be in touch with God the Father, those were terrible hours because that unity that view of his father, that relationship had always been love. And now he's filthy with sin. Now he's loaded down, and it's dark. I want you, secondly, to understand that while we are on this earth, we are strangers here. My wife and I were visiting early this morning, talking about some family issues. As long as you live on this earth, you may strive to do something good. But often, if you do good, you're going to create something else that's bad. Have you ever been in that situation? There's no good choice, right? Actually, that's the problem that faces our nation because Satan sets this up. You do this, you save Americans, but you waste Syrians. You avenge the people in the World Trade Center, but now you, you raised up a new crop of terrorists who are going to come over here and who are going to do their work. Everything has to be, has to be settled with love. And when a sinful person sees love, often they hate love. They don't want that. We were visiting together, and I said, you know what? There's no good options. What do we do? What do we do? We live in the shadow right now. The only real place that's governed by love is up in heaven. And when we see it here, it's a rare commodity. I guarantee if I go through the potluck here, I like to go through last, by the way. Don't push me too hard. Oh, pastor, you go first. But I've noticed that when I go through last that the pieces of watermelon are usually not red anymore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the best pieces, who's going to grab those? 
We give to the children, right? Would we do that in a home? Or would we say to grandpa and grandma, look, grandpa, here's some pieces for you. I think we would in the home. But here it's like a free-for-all. Little children get to go first. Somebody goes through last, it's white pieces. I used to laugh about this. I said I used to be able to judge the character of a church, the love there, by the, the color of the watermelon pieces you get at the end of the meal. Of course, I'm joking with you, but there's an element of truth in this. Who gets the biggest strawberry? And Uncle Arthur tells the story you know, about the boy. He'd always grab the biggest apple. He'd always get the best food. And I think his mom planted an apple in there that had a worm in it to teach him a lesson. Don't always take the biggest and the best. By nature, this is the way the earth is. What do you think God hands out when he is in heaven? I guarantee he will always give the best. Because this is the shadow, and that is the reality. This world we live on now, it's only a shadow. Remember when he said, God said to Moses, build the sanctuary. The sanctuary was a copy of what was in heaven, and they made it out of skins. Do you imagine a perfect skin? How is, how is a skin going to be perfect? It's cut off of an animal. Remember, when God made clothes for Adam and Eve, he took a couple of probably sheep, and he cut them open. Instead of fig leaves, he said, you put this on. That was imperfect. That came after sin. Everything here is like that, but heaven is always good. But it's been so difficult for us to understand the true nature of God. I'll tell you the truth. When I was a little boy, I'm a pastor's son, missionary's child. I went through all my elementary and high school studying at SDA institutions, studying at home, studying in school. From that age, I knew the Bible. But when the week of prayer came in, in uh, academy, I was studying in India. The speaker would speak, and I would sit there, and I would think to myself, Jesus comes. Think of all the things I did wrong this last year. And he has somebody recording everything. And the movie will run. I didn't know about video and television and all at that time. That will run, and I'm in trouble. I'll just tell you one thing. I worked with a little guy, a little bit younger than I, very stubborn, like me. And we took care of the chickens for the school. Sometimes we'd find old eggs. You know, the chickens like to hide their eggs here and there. Find old eggs, and I would save these in a can. And sometimes he would get out of line, and he'd talk to me and say things he, I didn't think he should. He actually was wrong in some of that. And I'd go to my can of eggs that were really rotten, and I would use the eggs on him. And we'd have a fight throwing eggs at each other, and he'd come out stinky. And I would think to myself when I saw the principal or someone else, I'm glad, sometimes I feared, you know, he would look at me very solemnly, and I'd think, I'm glad you can't read what's in my mind and what's in my heart, because I knew I was a rascal. And then you see Jesus coming in his purity, and you're in trouble, because you're naked. He can see everything. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13 again. He says here, the best thing is love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, even if I could speak like an angel, he says, I am just like a symbol. I am just like something that makes noise. By the way, the symbol in the band, in the orchestra, is, is one of the things I don't like. I mean, maybe use it once, but when they start using it a lot, I get tired of that in a hurry. A man or a woman talks all the time. We have problems with that. He said, if I don't have love, I'm like that. 
Do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge? Do I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love? I am nothing. Ellen White, if she didn't have love, forget all the books. Forget all the books. That is nothing compared to love. What is the greatest gift that God can give to any one of us? It's love. Why? Because it's the essence of heaven. Now, for a moment, I want to just take you to, to the issue of, let's say, home. I have a difficult time with this word home. Uh, somebody stopped me once. I was in Singapore. And the gentleman with me was from Bangladesh. He had known my family, known me for a long time. I had taught with his brother. And he stopped me. We were driving across Singapore. And he said, Pastor, you are very strange. He said, I don't think I've ever met anybody like you. He said, you're from Pakistan, right? I said, yes. He said, when you speak about Pakistan, when you speak about the language, you don't say their language, or you don't say that country. You say about that, you say my language. In our language, we say this. And then I would repeat the Urdu word. By the way, Urdu is a very interesting thing. We even speak Urdu in English. I could tell you many words. They have the same word in English that we have in Urdu. It's interesting, 12 hours time zone away, halfway around the world, but the words are the same. Have you ever drunk Hawaiian punch? Punch is a word out of Urdu. Punch is the word for five. And we say punch. But punch is a drink that used to be drunk by the Mughal emperors in which they mixed five juices. So you go to the supermarket and you say, I want some Hawaiian punch. The word that you're using is a word that we use in Pakistan for a mixed drink. Khaki. You know, the soldiers wear khaki, khaki, that color. That's, that means dirt. And khaki is a cloth, a color that looks like dirt. It's just brown. We have these words, you know, but... Here, here he says, Pastor, when you, when you talk about that other language, which is really your second language, although it's confusing for me because I'm not sure which is my first and which is my second, but he says, our language, my country, our country, you're not talking about America, you're talking about Southern Asia. I think we get confused like this. You know, what is home for us? And sometimes we end up thinking that this is home. But for me, it would be like Pakistan is home, whereas even though I've lived much longer over there, America is really where my forefathers came from. This is home. Probably the dearest place to me. There are several places in the world that I call home. One would be the mountains in India. I call that home. If I can, I go back up there, 7,500 feet, where I walked, where I hiked, where we studied. Home, here at the ranch, my people moved here in 1870. I don't live there because I bought it or because I chose it. I live there because that's home, my memories. I remember being at the ranch just a few weeks before my father died. He and I had settled up. There were things in my life I needed to confess to him. I let him down. Remember I told you I was mischief in school, mischievous, and he was on the school board. He was division secretary. I'm sure many times the principal would say, listen, I've got bad news for you, George, such and such. And uh, my father was a very loving man, but he's also a very tough guy. And uh, in those days, they didn't spare the rod. By the way, I kind of think that was better. I don't regret that. 
So this is home, where my father turned to me when I settled up. I said, Dad, I'm sorry for being a donkey back then. And he always turned and said to me, just four words. He said, I have no regrets. How about that? That takes me to our real text, which is found in Luke. And it's found in the 15th chapter. You know that that's the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And I want to close on this lost son theme because I believe that Jesus told this story more than anything else to just show us what the character of God is like. You know the story. It's simple. There's a son. He wants to lay his hands on dad's money, his share, and go out and party and do whatever he wants to do. Now, I will say to you at the beginning of this story, this is every man. This is every woman. We want to have it good. We want to have our way. By the way, freedom, independence is almost in my mind like sin. You can almost interchange that. I want my freedom. I want to say what I want to say. I, give me the floor. That's usually not led by God. Give me the money and let me go. And it is so clear here in Luke 15, when you get to the 12th, 13th verses, certain men had two sons. The younger said, Father, give me the portion of goods that followed to me, divided unto them as living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and wasted his substance with riotous living. Three verses describe what happened. I can tell you of Christians who have done this over and over and over and over again. And when the son is finished and he's eating pig's food, he's sitting in the pig's pen, he's hungry, he's in trouble, and he thinks about his father. And his father was thinking about him. By the way, this story is titled at the top of this chapter. You know, you've got counting the cost. This is called the lost son. This is not about the lost son. This is about the good father. Story, the prodigal son is only a means of Christ telling us what the father is like. Because Jesus' journey here was entirely about trying to show the world what God was really like, what his character was like. The dispute that's going on in the world today is about the character of God. It says here, when he came to himself, verse 17, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I'll say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. This is our thinking about God. He's thrown us out of the family now. We've lost the privilege of being a son. We go to him, we'll go on our hands and knees, we'll make our apologies. Remember what I did with my father? I went to him. He had two or three weeks left to live. He was dying with colon cancer. And I was thinking, I don't want my father to think that I haven't learned some lessons. I go to him and say, Father, I'm sorry. And he says, I have no regrets. So it says he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him 
had compassion. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son starts his story and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. The father doesn't even answer that. He doesn't even respond to that. He says, bring forth the best garment, the best robe, and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. You know something? We are not like that. If somebody goes out and messes up, I've heard this in committee so many times, a treasurer in the church gets in trouble some way. And everybody says, yes, they should be members again, but you know what? Don't trust them with any money. <laughs> Isn't that right? Would you take a swindler? Would you take a cheat? Down here, south of here, they had some million dollar scandal years ago in, in uh, one of these towns south of Fresno. I've heard, I came 15 years afterwards, I heard that story. He did a little jail time, I think. Do you think he's going to be made treasurer again? <laughs> no way, Jose. Father says, bring the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat, let us party, let us be merry. For this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. They began to party because the son was home. My friends, that is what God's character is. I can show you the text in the Bible, Isaiah 53. Jesus comes as a, a simple man, a poor man. It says that he is like, his appearance is like a root out of dry ground, a potato. <laughs> Cassava. It doesn't look very good when you, when you buy it in the market. By the way, I have some good-looking potatoes at the ranch right now. A friend of mine... He planted some of his old potatoes. They're giving the shoots. I saw those green shoots coming up. I said, I've got some of those too. You know, you keep the potato too long and it starts setting up. I took this out in the garden. I buried it. I cut it in a few pieces. Now the shoots are coming out. It looks wonderful. It looks better than the tomatoes. I'm not peeking, by the way, to see what's down underneath. I'm hoping, if I keep it moist and soft, that someday there'll be some potatoes underneath there. But Jesus didn't come as a hand. These pictures you see of Jesus looking so handsome and nice. No, the Bible doesn't say that. That's artist conception. And he died to pay for us. He was beaten because of me. That's what heaven is like. That's what God is like. He pays the price. We can't even pay it, and he pays the price. Do you think he wants to keep us out of heaven? Do you think he set up a system where he's going to grind us to powder at the end of time and we're all just going to disappear? Or do you think his promise in John 14 is correct that he's gone to build homes for us and that he wants us there? I'm not saying that we'll go there in all of our dirtiness. There's some showers that we have to go through. There's some cleansing that he does. Mostly, I want you to understand that that's cleansing that he cares for. Because we're so dirty, we can't even care for ourselves. God cares for that. God brings us around. You know what? I meet friends that knew me in my school days back in high school, and, and they say, you're a pastor? Really? Is this George I'm talking to? You were, you were an officer of the church? You were union president? You were ministerial secretary of the division? All I can say is, that's all by the grace of God. Right? God has his way, but he never gives up. 
He never gives up. The greatest of these is love. By the way, the wonderful thing is, he is all love. He cares for us in love. He's willing to throw that party when we return. He's willing to work with us. I'm sure that the prodigal son returning home, he did not think that he was going to be treated that way, but sometimes his father maybe had to counsel him a little bit and say, son, listen to me. And now the son listens rather than rejecting the father's counsel. I don't think the son wanted to go out and party again like he'd done before. He learned his lesson. He knew what pig's food tasted like. Do we know what sin tastes like? Do we know? If we're really honest, we'll be shaking our head this way. We know. I don't want it anymore. I want to go to heaven. I want to live in front of God. I want to experience love in my own family. Love with my children, with my grandchildren. I want to be God's child here. Because I know if I'm God's child here, I'm going to be yearning to live in God's presence in heaven. The greatest of these is love. Let's give our hearts to him once again. I have to do this daily and be thankful for a loving God that never looks at us as we were but he always looks at us with the potential that we have for what he will do in our lives if we will but allow him to do that. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. We're unworthy. We slip with our words. We slip with our thoughts. We want to eat what we please, even though we know that's killing us. We think that that's fun. And somehow, in your great wisdom, you are patient with us. I'm sure that Satan points his finger at us and says, Ha, this is no Job you have. These people are sinners. But you're looking at us and you know what we will become. You know that we've set our faces toward heaven. And even though we are only prodigals walking toward home, that you have great plans for us. And when you return, when we return to you, you, you rejoice. You think in your heart, my son, my daughter was dead. Now they're alive again. Thank you for that great love. Thank you that you call us. Speak to every one of us today and through our lives and draw us with those cords of love. We love you, Lord. Come soon. In Jesus' name, amen.